Hello, Shia. Hello, Francesco. Hi. Welcome to Zooming In. It's nice to see you again. Yes, it's been a nice little while. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here we are. Should we give people one or two minutes to? Yes, we're going to let people in? a couple minutes to trickle in. I see that uh, numbers are growing, so people are zooming in, and then we'll we'll start the program officially. Yeah, so we're just a minute or two. All, we're delighted that you're all joining us uh, for another mm -hmm. semester of zooming in. <laughs> So welcome to Zooming In. I'm going to lead us into our conversation today, and this is going to be our bi-weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley. I'm Shil Gal Kuchavi, and joining me is our fearless curator, Francesco Spaniolo. Hi, Francesco. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, as we did in the past semester, this is once again a Zoom, a Zoom webinar, which means that all of our participants have their videos turned off, but you can interact with us in two ways. You can use the lower bars on your screen uh, and press on the chat button to send us any technical questions if you're having any technical difficulties or send us your location. We're always happy to know where you're Zooming in with us from. Um, and if you have any questions for us today, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. We'll be presenting for approximately 20 minutes and we'll leave a few minutes in the end to answer any of your questions. Throughout these coming, the series of these coming talks, we'll be reflecting on exhibitions presented by the Magnus over the last decade, highlighting how they will be revisited in the context of Time Capsule, a new exhibition opening in the fall. As a reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. And here we go. So, and here we go. <laughs> so, so, so just let's give, let's give our audience a little background. Yeah. And thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction, Shir. Uh, also, as a reminder, there is a third uh, person working on this uh, webinar. Ross Calter joined us uh, in the fall. He's an undergraduate student. Uh, we don't see him, he's, on, he's not on screen, but he's behind the scenes and answering chat and managing the Q&A and, and sort of making us look good. Yeah, and we're uh, very happy to have you with us, yes. Ross. Thank you. So, so a little background. Uh, you know, 2019, we were really working hard on preparing what was supposed to be a retrospective exhibition. We're looking back, 20, 2020 was supposed to be our 10th anniversary of the Magnus at UC Berkeley. The Magnus started out in 1962. A little bit of history. I won't give about a two hour lecture. I will just give a two minute lecture. In 1962 in Berkeley as an independent Jewish museum. And in 2010 joined uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, we opened a new facility in downtown Berkeley, actually essential new facility because for the first time in the history of this collection that as, as you said, is a very important uh, collection on, a, in, on the world. A stage mm -hmm. of Jewish museums. Uh, for the first time, we had essentially 100%, like 98% of the holdings of the whole collection on site. So we could really work on it and not have to deal with storage spaces that were sort of like the Raiders of the Lost Ark at the end of the movie, for those who remember uh, the Spielberg movie with uh, crate after crate right. after crate. And uh, so we were able to really think about the collection in a different way, access it in a different way, share it with others in, in a different way. And uh, we were planning for 2020 to have a, a retrospective, look back, see what worked, how it worked, and uh, highlights from, from a decade of, of exhibition work. Uh, then I think something happened about a year ago, a little, a little less Maybe. than a year ago, a little something happened and we started uh, going into shelter in place. And not only we had to think about how to create a new exhibition uh, that was uh, to be created while social distancing. So while not being able to work together being in the same room around the objects in the collection uh, that uh, we cherish so much. The work that we do is so connected with the materiality of objects. But actually, this really prompted us to rethink the project and to rethink in a way and think deeply about sort of the, the, the role of collecting of uh, museums 
and of memory and especially of Jewish memory work uh, and even the politics of display <laughs> in some sorts. Mm -hmm. So we are going to launch in the fall and we're hope hoping, of course, it's still a hope, but we're planning around this hope to reopen the, the galleries of the Magnus in the fall. And uh, we're launching a new exhibition that ended up uh, being called Time Capsules. Uh, uh, we are looking at both collecting collections and exhibitions as memory work. And in a way, exhibitions are selections of, uh, of collections. So they're kind of collections of collections. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot to, to there's a little bit of meta work, but a lot to unpack, as we like to say in academia uh, here. And uh, so as we revisit what we did, we really revisit the, the, the way in which we've we've been working. So we started, we start this week, so we devote this semester of Zooming in, as you said, Shir, we're meeting every other week. Every other so week. this, so this uh, Friday, and if you go on our website and you will receive emails and so on, um, and Facebook and Instagram all have this information, but every other week between now and May, we'll be reviewing six past exhibitions that are all going to be part of the time capsules exhibition project that we'll be presenting in the fall. There are six out of 10 exhibitions we're highlighting in the time capsules project. We figured 10 years, 10 exhibitions kind of fit together. And uh, also really as a way to think about the future of collecting and, and the importance. As a reminder, during these 10 years, the Magnus not only established itself at UC Berkeley, but also it, the collections grew uh, almost exponentially with, with very important gifts. And I will just mention two and we discussed them in the fall. In uh, 2017, the Magnus received the gift to purchase the what is now named the Toby family Arthur Schick uh, collection, very, very important collection uh, all around the work of Polish uh, uh, Jewish artist uh, Arthur Schick, first half of 20th century. And in 2018, we received, and we also talked about this during our Zooming In series, uh, the monumental gift of the Roman Vishniaka archive and we're, uh, during these months, really going through a lot of images and really thinking deeply about this archive. But uh, let's go back in time, uh, 10 years of exhibitions. We start with an exhibition from 2012 called the Inventory Project. This was an exhibition that was created as a collaboration, it was the first such collaboration with a scholar. The idea was we have this collection, we have, we're at the, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, we have a whole global mind beehive of, of thinkers. We invited for this project, Jeffrey Chandler, who's one of the leading scholars of modern Jewish culture in the United States, is a professor at Rutgers University. But in a way, this exhibition was also the result of preliminary academic work. Jeffrey Chandler, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet of New York University and Pullen Museum, Laura Levitt of uh, Temple University and I uh, put together a panel for the Association for Jewish Studies around that time. And we we're really thinking about uh, everything that kind of went into this exhibition. Jeff Chandler at the time was researching, was putting out a new essay on the role of inventory making, list making in modern Jewish life and was really investigating uh, this uh, interesting and, and, and seldom, as he, as he said, seldom considered feature that is a constant in Jewish life that seemingly Jews, Jewish communities, individuals, organizations, have this proclivity for making lists and making inventories. And as we know, inventories and in a way archives are open-ended, they never end. So it's really the kind of work that in Jewish tradition we see as it's not on you, they, you know, we, we have this saying, it's not on you to complete the work, but you, you're, you're not exempt from, from continuing. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. In, in Hebrew. And so, <laughs> we are adding to inventories. In a way, this exhibition was an inventory of inventories. We called it inventory project for that reason. So as we go through the some of the objects, some highlights of this exhibition, um, Shir, I know you prepared a few questions for me and you're going to, uh, yeah. as I like to say, <laughs> quoting a, a Francois Truffaut movie, shoot the piano player, because I was the piano player here, was the curator of, of these exhibitions. So I'm on the spot yes. and, uh, and I'm under, uh, Strict Under investigation and investigation from Shir Kochavi. It's so wonderful to to be the 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 object of your questions here. So, shoot away. Thank you. So before we really look into the list of categories that was prepared by Jeffrey and yourself when you were researching this project, I wanted to ask as kind of a preliminary question: Why is this type of partnership with scholars 
so important? Why is it so important that the Magnus especially? Well, you know, the, the, the Magnus is a collection of memory objects. It's a collection of fragments. And I swear I did not prepare this answer. So I'm just, I'm just trying to react to your question in real time. It, it is a collection of memory objects. It's a collection of fragments. And uh, the work, the curatorial work is that of, in many cases, of recombining these fragments, reuniting, understanding how they fit together if they do. And in doing this, we rely on the expertise of people who have been studying very, going very deeply into certain aspects of, of Jewish history. So that's, that's one answer, which is that uh, we want as many thinking partners as possible. And we're blessed in this uh, crazy world of ours to be connected digitally with uh, lots of people in different time zones. So we know that our curatorial work is really a global work of uh, a, 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 a global mind of people that collaborate uh, with us all the time. But then there was the added idea of inviting a mm -hmm. scholar exactly. to come to the Magnus and kind of watch in a way from So the curatorial work was that ob observing uh, a scholar kind of roam free in the collection. So with, you know, free with a certain, you know, still wearing gloves. So that kind of freedom in, in, a, in a collection, <laughs> but uh, roaming free and, and coming up with ideas, with connections, with ideas that would not be part of what curators and, and museum staff that work every day with the with the collection and the objects would, would really see. So kind of a way to look beyond. And, and this, uh, this uh, template has continued in the history of Magnus exhibitions with invited scholars and also very much with uh, students, undergraduate, graduate students uh, who become co-curators, assistant curators, and really co-thinkers and uh, with whom we discover uh the the collection we discover what's in there we understand it in different ways so i guess it's a maybe longer answer than you expected but the goal no, the goal here is really uh curatorial work as a way to open perspectives not as directing viewers minds one way or another but finding new meaning constant new meaning and, and meanings and, and connections uh within the collection and beyond and Thank you, Francesco. This was a perfect answer. And of course, I had the opportunity to work with a few of these scholars and students um, on a regular basis. Can you give us an example of the reinterpretation that the exhibition offers of objects that prior to being acquired by the Magnus belong to either a Jewish organization or a private family? Because we're going to look at a few of these examples later on. And I thought maybe you could Show us a couple. Well, in the case of the inventory project, which we're going to examine in just a few seconds, uh, what happened is that Jeffrey Shandler came to the Magnus and he actually started with an inventory. He started with the collection database and other inventory documents we had and started probing and, and looking at objects through categories, to search categories that were his own and that were not necessarily applicable to the collection itself. And all kinds of objects emerged. Then those objects were discussed with me and with other uh, colleagues on, on staff and new associations were created and new discoveries were made. And essentially objects that may have escaped, escaped our attention for one reason or another uh, came to prominence. Um, so it really is a way of discovery and, uh, and an invitation to the public, to the general public. So those who are watching as right now from home and those that will come to uh, uh, to the museum once we reopen uh, the doors and of course everybody who can visit our collections online we have thousands and thousands of 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 images and other documentation online uh, it's an invitation to really uh, continue to discover these materials we start and we started the exhibition with not just the cornerstone. This is a corn, the cornerstone. It was unearthed in, in 2001, but it was, it was placed in 1895 in what is today the oldest synagogue building in San Francisco it was Congregation of Habe Shalom. Um, my suspicion and just not just suspicion was founded by a fringe of, uh, of members of the two other major congregations at the time, second half of the 19th century in San Francisco. That is to say, Congregation Emmanuel and Sheriff Israel in San Francisco, and uh, was was uh, started by an offshoot mostly of Alsatian Jewish immigrants to San Francisco. Hence, the Shalom with an E 
and also in looking at their liturgical books, because we have those archival resources, we understand that they were all coming from a Francophone, German Francophone world. And this cornerstone was placed and inside we see that there is a, there is a cavity and inside the cavity was a time capsule, which in a way gives the title to our exhibition project for the fall. Um, that's memory work, and it's the, not, not the only type of memory work that Jews, uh, that Jews are always engaged with. We know that uh, historically and traditionally and for centuries and millennia, Jews used uh, time capsules called uh, Geniza, uh, a, a, a place to hide documents that are uh, no longer readable or that should not be read, should not be in the, in public, in the public eye. There is most famously a Geniza unearthed in the, in the 19th century in Cairo that continues to reveal incredible manuscripts and documents about, uh, about not just the Jewish past, but the Mediterranean past as a whole. But a time capsule, which is a more modern concept, uh, was applied to synagogues as well. Just a few months ago in, uh, in, uh, in the UK, a time capsule was, was discovered it yep, was made of glass. This one is made of zinc, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, we can go back to the to the previous slide. Yep. Here we go. And here is a, some examples of what uh, what uh, congregants of Hobe Shalom put in this time capsule in the cornerstone. And what they did is essentially they created a small museum. A time capsule is a is a collection, is an anthology. In this case, it was an anthology of their lives. They had a mezuzah. We see some coins, and then all documents, congregational documents, bylaws as we see here, the form of application, and we see that time was not too kind to it, uh, yeah. to, and, uh, and it was corroded by, by the elements, even inside the zinc box, inside the, 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 the cornerstone. And uh, this is really the cornerstone of our exhibition project and was the cornerstone of the exhibition project uh, the, that we worked on in the, of, of uh, the inventory project <laughs> about a decade ago. We had all kinds of other materials in there, so we're gonna slide. Yeah. Before, before we do, I just wanted to quickly point out and ask you another kind of squeeze in another quick question, Francesco, if that's okay, about the difference in the role of synagogues and of a collecting institution or a museum in the preservation of the Jewish past. Oh, yes, I, I, I was elegantly skipping your question. Well, essentially, what, what there, there, it's, it's probably, again, here, at least two answers to your question. One is, in general, what happens to an object when it crosses from the, from the outside world into the doors of a museum collection. And, okay. uh, um, you know, an object uh, it, in a museum collection is preserved, as we like to say, in perpetuity. And so by, the, by virtue of collecting uh, institutions also try to guarantee longevity to items. So now we're looking at something that's made of uh, paper, ink, and glue materials that are not very easy to preserve. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of work goes into preserving them, but there's another shift that happens there and it's a shift of meaning. Um, synagogues for centuries have been archives and, and Jewish museums of sorts. And then Jewish museum enter the scene in the 19th century and also in a way stole a little bit away from the synagogue that role of being preservers of memory. But both institutions uh, share uh, the memory work that characterizes Jewish culture. There is a mandate, mandate it's it religious and, and spiritual and cultural mandate in Judaism to remember. Uh, it's, a, it's a divine commandment to remember. Zachor is the word in Hebrew. Uh, so maybe Jewish museums are sort of like a secular version of what synagogues used to be in terms of uh, uh, the practice of memory work, of daily museum work that Jewish communities worldwide have engaged themselves in. That's and what we're looking at, and, it. And, and, what, uh, and what we're looking at right now is really an example of that. This is memory work. What this is, and you know, it's, it's actually a very large document, it's big. It's like almost like a poster, like, you know, people would have posters and, you know, when we were kids, we would have posters of our uh, rock stars or uh, movie, stars and other heroes or I, you know, whatever heroes we had, uh, but it, it's about that size. And what this is, is once one starts decrypting everything into, into this manuscript is actually a communal celebration of the first closing of the uh, Talmudic study called Siyum Ashas. The, the, the Talmudic study is called Dafyumi. The idea, it was an idea that, that, that started in the early 20th, in actually 1923. 
um, and um, and basically how to collectively around the world Jews can read one page of the Talmud a day, and it takes seven and a half years to get to the to the end of the of the cycle. And this was the first end of the cycle. It was celebrated in a in a big uh, ceremony in Jerusalem on February first of nineteen thirty one. And was also celebrated in Slovakia in the in the Jewish community of Kosice or in Yiddish Kashoy. And the way they celebrated is they listed, and so we have on the page you can point, you can use a pointer and yeah. and, and and guide us, but has the 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 names in in the the, the bold characters are are the, the names of the Talmudic tractates, and next to them are the names of the congregants that took on that reading and 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 led the reading of those tractates. So it's, it's, a, it's an inventory, it's a list, and it's also very much memory work for us because that community in Kosice was completely wiped out in the Holocaust. So these names have more value than just any list in, in, uh, of any sort. And finally, for this group of documents from synagogues, we have this beautiful machzol for the festival of Shavuot from our Karite manuscript collection. Oh, this is a great uh, manuscript. It's beautiful uh, liturgical manuscript. So Machzor is a is a is a prayer book for the festivals or the high holidays. This is for the festival of Shavuot, uh, Pentecost, and uh, at the end of the manuscript, after all of the liturgical texts are listed in the and we see it on the right hand side of the of the screen. At the end of the manuscript, so on the left of our screen today, is a list of community members, and they are categorized. They are categorized according to their uh, uh, tribal origins uh, within Judaism, so as Kohen, Levites, and Israelites. And but also there is an added category which is specific to the Karaite community at the time, which is those households where husbands have more than one wife. So there is really a community census of sort, and these categories are clearly adapted to the reality, the social reality of the time. So again, lists can reflect aspirations and also uh, the real life of people in real time in specific uh, places. And now we move into finance. Uh, finance and financial records actually show us uh, much and contain a wealth of, of information that goes far beyond the amounts of money that they document. This is a great object and I'm so glad that uh, in 2008 the Judah Magnet Museum was able to, to purchase it. Uh, it's uh, it was an invention. It was a probably a business plan that didn't go too well uh, <laughs> by a, a certain Moses Cohen, who in 1913 in Washington D.C. Pat patented this object. It, so the 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 uh, ritual mandate during the Sabbath and the festivals is for Jews to, among other things, not just not work but also not write. At the same time. Uh, the Sabbath and, and the festivals are a great opportunity for fundraising, hence finance, as you, as you said earlier. The question is, if I go to your synagogue here and I pledge a gift of X amount of uh, whatever currency you are requesting at a time or offering at a time, you won't be able to write down who I am, my name, where I live, essentially how to track me down and make sure that I come through on my pledge. Exactly. Uh, because you can't write. So this, with these dials, um, somebody in, in a synagogue could write down without actually writing on paper, name, address, and uh, amount of pledge, and when the pledge was made, and so on. So all of the different dials compose names, street names, and actually give a taxonomy of urban Jewish life, or urban life in America in the early 20th century, because the street address is very interesting. There are different streets and squares, and, and this is all in Yiddish on the on the written mm -hmm. printed in Yiddish on this. So it's cardboard with these like little dials that are metallic, and they have rivets, and they're stuck into the into the the cardboard so they can rotate. And um, and um, so the, there's there there's uh, streets, there are there are uh, buildings, floors, mm -hmm. aisles. Uh, north, south, north, west. south, of course, for the orientation of the you know which you know if I'm on. West Eighth uh, uh, Street. It needs to be uh, written there if I live in Manhattan, etc., and so on. So it's it's a it's a kind of a work, a genius work, and and probably a really poor business plan. It didn't really. There are a few left, and 
it really didn't take hold, but probably the inventor thought that they would be able to sell multiples of these to every congregation in America and beyond. And even more lists. Uh, this is a memorial plaque um, printed in Hungary, uh, very common in the, in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, when uh, relatives, descendants of a deceased person, uh, had to remember when to recite Kaddish, the memorial Kaddish for, for their parents, their deceased, deceased relatives. And, um, and uh, they had to reconcile the Hebrew date, the, the date of the, of the Jewish calendar with the date of the Gregorian calendar. This is the time in which Jews very much were living according to the Gregorian calendar as we do in, 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 in Western societies to this day. But in, in reconciling that with Jewish time, a calendar like this was actually quite useful. So it was pre-printed. We see, by the way, there, are, there is on this, on this uh, print, there is another very important list at the top you highlighted. In, in pink is the Decalog, uh, probably the first and most important list in the history of the Jews, uh, the Ten Commandments. But interesting enough, numbered with Roman numerals, not with Hebrew letters, another common practice. And then handwritten on the printed uh, cardboard uh, broadside are the dates and, and the, the months uh, and the years of the Gregorian calendar, kind of reconciling when the anniversary of uh, death would occur to remember when to join a minion, go to synagogue and recite Kaddish for a deceased person. And then of course, all other visual elements so that this could be also a display, piece, a display piece in somebody's home. So a list can also be something to be looked at and not just something to, to be used exactly. as is the case. And here we move into leisure and souvenirs of different moments in time, leisure activities and tourism, camping, which are all modern, kind of part of a one big modern phenomena. Yeah, um, as we were researching uh, the collection with uh, Jeffrey Chandler, uh, we were unearthing various uh, materials and this one came up. He didn't find this, I think. I, maybe I did, maybe our registrar, Julie Franklin, didn't. I, I can remember. Uh, fascinating object, uh, belongs to uh, the memory of Camp Kiloa, was with one of the earliest, if not the earliest uh, Jewish summer camp in California, it was in the uh, Huntington Lake in the, in the Sierras. And uh, uh, the founders were also the founders of the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. So it's a, it's a history that, that's very much embedded in the history of Jews in California, especially in Northern California. And Stephen Zellerbach and his family had donated his childhood uh, memento from this camp. Uh, on the right side, we have actually, it's a, basically it's a promo, promotional book that families would receive with photo, scrapbook with photographs, other promotional materials. On the left is the list of activities that uh, the young campers, uh, Stephen Zellerbach, I, 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 I met uh, Stephen uh, later in his life. I remember talking with him about this, but uh, fond memories. Uh, all of this in this, uh, of course, uh, something that's, uh, that's to be uh, really reflected upon these days. There was a theme, a Native American theme in the early 20th century that should be really rethought. And luckily we are in the Bay Area very much rethinking and renaming lands uh, according to the, to the, the original inhabitants. Yeah of the lands that we occupy today. In, in 1936, the camp also uh, had a promotional video that we've also yeah. uh, shared we online. We, we have it, we'll share it on, 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 on social media. It's, uh, it's pretty quirky and fantastic and uh, uh, Jewish boys and girls frolicking in the Sierras, in the, in the California Sierras in the 1930s. And more boys and more different and, and more types of, of, of inventories. Here we have postcards. So lists, again, on the left side, uh, Jewish children types in, in, in Yiddish, Yiddish kinder typen, right? So a postcard, very ubiquitous. We had a whole program about postcards in the fall, you and I share. So uh, those who followed us or can catch up, catch up on, on all the videos that we have shared of the previous talks can, can find that, uh, that, uh, that Zooming in program. They but, might even um, identify these postcards. From postcards were used to communicate globally in the late 19th, early 20th century. And they would feature various examples of Jewish life. So in this case, Jewish kids on the, on the left of our screen and another postcard with a list of Yiddish writers, the luminaries of Yiddish literature. We, we see Sholem Aleichem, uh, Peretz and others, but also 
lists of other types we unearthed with, uh, with Jeffrey Chandra as we researched in the collection, uh, a collection of steins, multiple, uh, multiple postcards that typify Jews in anti-Semitic, according to anti-Semitic stereotypes. Many of these, as we've explored in the past, were uh, very much produced by Jews themselves who were kind of uh, um, stereotyping their own their own features. And they were doing it not just visually, but also musically. We had prepared, but I think we're gonna skip it. We had prepared yeah. a song from this uh, collection, Jew Face. There are many songs that do the same thing in music and lyrics that, that these postcards were doing at the time. Weird and interesting early uh, Jewish Americana, essentially. Oops. And then we have more. And now for Apologize. something, yeah. <laughs> And now for uh, an ending with the, with the concept of protection, which we also yeah. opened with in the in our series in the fall, and we're ending with today the concept of wearing or carrying the protection as a form of empowerment. And oftentimes, uh, amulets like the one we're looking at now are lists. They're lists of words, and most times those words are names of angels. And in this case, it's interesting because there's not only, well, at the top of the, of the amulet is God under the crown is the name of, is one of the names of God, Shaddai, but there's also uh, the name of the city of Jerusalem and then a set of angels and then names of rabbis from antiquity to the present. Uh, so lists are also ways to establish hierarchies. And the, the, the most recent rabbi, uh, Abraham Ben Diwan, is at the bottom the of the amulet. God is at the top, but clearly the two are somewhat related. So even though something is at the top of the list and something at the bottom, the relationship is made by the list. And the relationship is made by exhibiting. Exhibitions are forms of lists uh, 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 as well. Here is another example of a protective uh, document. In, in this case, the list here, this is a decoration for the sukkah in the, in the, in the, in the, in the holiday of tabernacles. The, huts, these uh, shelters, temporary shelters are built and often decorated. Nowadays, we decorate them with all kinds of even contemporary images. But traditionally, uh, the idea is that of inviting uh, um, biblical ancestors to, to visit the sukkah. And so at the center in those roundels are, are uh, names of what are called ushpizim uh, that are listed. It's an interesting document. It also has an Ouroboros, it's the, the snake biting its tail, so probably has some amuletic and protective value uh, as well. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great manuscript in the collection that came out, such as this other painted manuscript. This is a fairly big one, and it's a calendar for counting the Omer, the days between uh, uh, Shavuot, so uh, Pesach and, and yes. Shavuot. And, uh, and, uh, and, but with Kabbalistic uh, information, so each day acquire, of the 49 days of count, uh, acquires a, a specific Kabbalistic flavor. And all of this painted and decorated with texts that include blessings and prayers and psalms and amuletic uh, value as well. Uh, this was most likely to be uh, displayed in a synagogue, maybe brought out at the right time of the year. Uh, and clearly uh, protection is part of this, especially with the bottom psalm. Uh, 67 and Anabikoach, which are also often used in amulets. So uh, this is an example, what we discussed today is an example of how inviting uh, a, a scholar to look into the collection means finding new objects or thinking about same objects in, in different ways. And we will continue week, every other week, not week after week with our zooming in here, to uncover past exhibitions and see how we're rethinking them in, the, in this new format of time capsules that we'll be presenting at yes. the Magnus, not virtually, not on Zoom, no. but at the real Magnus, kind of like the one that is uh, displayed in my virtual background today. Um, I see that we have a couple of questions. So before we part ways with, uh, with our uh, viewers today, let's see let's uh, if there's uh, anything- I that, also have uh, more questions for you, but I think we might have to wait with them for next week. I will just answer one, uh, one of these. They're, they're wonderful questions today. We'll just address one because we're really running out of time. But are all of these on paper? Is the subject of inventory in this assumed to be only on paper? No, no, it's not. We also had in, in, the, in the, first of all, we saw, we, we showed objects in, at the beginning of the talk, but also sometimes lists are engraved on 
silver or other metal objects or and painted. Uh, painted of course and not necessarily on paper but on wood and so on we just had a few documents today in our in our uh, selection so no it's not mandatory that are on paper and uh, as a reminder we'll be back in two Next. weeks oh yes in two weeks and we will be discussing another exhibition this time from 2013 sound objects uh, what we did for that exhibition we didn't just display objects that make sound we actually played them and recorded them and so we have now this interesting data bank of very strange synagogue sounds that museums don't usually deal with uh, so much so it's, it was a re rather innovative project and we'll discuss next week the topic of sound studies and how it applies to the synagogue thank you so thank much you. here and thank, thank you for everybody joining for us. joining us today and thank you, Ross, for all your help today. We're looking forward to see you in two weeks.